What news? What news? Apostle John. What is the news from the great beyond? What have you seen in the heavenly realm? Did it reassure or did it overwhelm? Overwhelm. Okay, now we're going to look at interspirituality and universalism, which I believe are the, the fruits of contemplative prayer. Universalism and interspirituality. Universalism is the notion that all people of faith ultimately worship the same God, but by a different name. Therefore, salvation will be achieved by people of all faiths or no faith. Interspirituality is the cross-pollination of religious traditions. It is the blending of esoteric practices from different religions while still identifying with one's own religion. For instance, it is a belief that one can be a better Christian when one practices Buddhist meditation. Now, some people may laugh at that, but that is the essence of interspirituality, that it's like a buffet. You know, you go to a buffet, you can take whatever you want, and it's all good food, supposedly, so you can pick a little of this, a little of that. We have some uh, stunning pictures here coming up for you. Remember I told you that uh, you were going to laugh? Well, I have a picture coming up that I believe is absolutely stunning and kind of uh, capsulizes uh, what we're talking about here today. This is Vancouver School of Theology. Now, I kind of think it looks kind of like Hogwarts. <laughs> Doesn't it, sort of? Well, this is Vancouver School of Theology in um, Vancouver, British Columbia, and this is where they train pastors to fill the pulpits of the Anglican and United Churches of Canada, okay, which are the two main churches in, uh, two main Protestant churches in Canada. And in this uh, Vancouver School of Theology, they have the Thomas Merton Reading Room, okay, because he's really popular with the uh, Anglican and the United Church pastors. Now this is the, to me, this, this is the stunning picture. You know what they say? One picture is worth a thousand words, right? Well, this is, this is the quintessential uh, uh, meaning of that, that when you see this picture, you're gonna understand what a time of departing is all about. Okay, you see on the, on the side there, on the uh, left-hand side, we have the portrait of Thomas Merton. Do you see that what's underneath him? Can you see? That is a statue of the Buddha. So in, at the Thomas uh, Merton Reading Room at the Vancouver School of Theology, there's the marriage of East and West, the marriage of Christianity and Buddhism. And on the other side, we have a picture of Thomas Merton and the Dalai Lama. And by the way, that uh, Dalai Lama there is the current Dalai Lama. And they were very close, very, very close. And the Dalai Lama considered Thomas Merton to be a Lama, you know, just like him. Lama means like a Tibetan Buddhist holy man. So um, this is what I see. If Thomas Merton tried to awaken God's people, as Richard Foster told me, I wonder what Thomas Merton would say, or uh, Richard Foster would say to this picture. Would a man like this be in a position to awaken Christianity or awaken God's people? So that's the big question here. This is, uh, we're at the crossroads right now. Christianity is going, part of it's going in the direction of contemplative prayer and part of it's going in the direction of a church like this. And people are kind of being shaken into the, these two camps. And so they have to make decisions, you know, which, which camp are you gonna be in? The Thomas Merton camp or the John MacArthur camp. You know, I'm using him as a representation of what uh, conservatives believe. Why do they have a picture of, a portrait of Thomas Merton with a, a statue of the Buddha? Well, it's because the God he, Thomas Merton, knew in prayer was the same experience that Buddhists describe in their enlightenment. That's it in a nutshell. That's why they have the Buddha alongside Thomas Merton, because they worship the same God. They had the same experience. And at the Vancouver School of Theology, 
we have uh, professors who have followed Thomas Merton's lead. This is a man named David Lockheed, and he teaches, uh, he's a, uh, a minister, scholar, theologian, and professor. Talk about credentials. <laughs> and this guy should really know Christianity, but unfortunately he's, um, he's influenced uh, generations of ministers, and you can um, find him sitting in his classroom floor as he teaches Buddhist meditation to 25 United Anglican Church ministers. So this is the ripe fruit of Thomas Merton's uh, approach to Christianity. Okay, toward a world religion for the new age. A worldwide movement is trying to usher in a world religion for the new age through interfaith ec ecumenism and the promotion of mystical practices that all religions can embrace. Okay, we're gonna look at some interspiritual writers and thinkers. Hey, okay, folks, um, how many of you have ever wondered what Christianity's greatest sin is? You ever wonder that, what Christianity's greatest sin is? Well, you're gonna find out. Get ready to find out. This is uh, M. Scott Peck. He wrote a book called The Road Less Traveled. This was uh, one of the best-selling books of psychology in uh, the 1980s and early 1990s. It sold eight million copies. Eight million copies. Influenced enormous numbers of people. And the type of people that bought that, bought that book were not you know, um, you know they, they were like shakers and movers in society. They were people who had influence. You know, a lot of pastors uh, bought that book. And this is a, um, a um, um, tape that he put out called Further Along the Road Less Traveled. This was in the early 90s. And in it, M. Scott Peck tells us what Christianity's greatest sin is. Now, of course, M. Scott Peck was a mystic. He was... He practiced contemplative prayer and promoted it. He said, I spent 20 years in Zen Buddhism, which prepared me for Christianity. Well, it prepared him for contemplative Christianity. To the degree that, he said, Zen Buddhism, Zen Buddhism should be taught in every fifth grade class in America. Okay, and here we go. Here, are you ready? Christianity's greatest sin is to think that other religions are not saved because, you know, God is in everybody and everything. Everyone is connected to God. There's no way you cannot be connected to God. So that's why it's Christianity's greatest sin. But from our perspective, other religions are not saved because they don't have a savior. There's no savior. I mean, Buddha didn't die for my sins. You know, Muhammad didn't die for my sins. Lao Tzu didn't die for my sins. So there's no savior in these other religions. So how can I... How can I believe they're, uh, they're saved when they have no savior? Doesn't that make sense? You know, to me it does, you know, but not to M. Scott Peck. He thinks it's um, Christianity's greatest sin. Yeah, this is Marcus Borg. Now, for those, how many of you have a Lutheran background? Oh, practically everybody. <laughs> okay, Marcus Borg, does that sound Norwegian or something? Because Marcus Borg grew up in a small town in North Dakota going to a Lutheran church. He, he, t this is like the male Sioux Monk kid here. He's very much like a male Sioux Monk kid. Small town, North Dakota, probably farm background, Lutheran church. Marcus Borg. So um, he goes off to uh, college or seminary or somewhere, you know, to get a better education. And he says, I learned from my professors and the readings they assigned, okay, it's probably a seminary, and the readings they assigned that Jesus almost certainly was not born of a virgin, did not think of himself as the son of God, and did not see his purpose as dying for the sins of the world. So he says that his boyhood faith was like Humpty Dumpty, you know, laid broken, you know, on the, on the ground there, just totally shattered. So um, did he bail out of Christianity and embrace some other religion? Well, no, he stayed within Christianity, but he embraced mystical Christianity. He's written quite a number of books. Uh, the, the book, that one was from, was The God We Never Knew, which is the God that Christians never knew. <laughs> this one is called The Heart of Christianity, Rediscovering a Life of Faith. Uh, and I can't read what it says in the middle there, something about how we can have a more. Can any of you read that in the middle, that part there? Something about uh, 
fat, yeah, passionate faith, you know, so he, he still considers himself a Christian. Now, Marcus Borg is very popular with um, mainline Protestant pastors. Like if you're an Episcopalian or a United Methodist or a Presbyterian or perhaps more liberal Lutheran or somebody like that, then most likely you, you think highly of Marcus Borg. Books are very popular. And he says in the heart of Christianity that our central problem is not sin and guilt. Our problem is our estrangement, our blindness to the presence of God, our separation from the spirit who is all around us and within us and to which we belong. So it's not a matter of reality, it's a matter of consciousness. In other words, everyone is connected to God, but they don't know it. All they have to do is do contemplative prayer and they'll see that God is in everything and everybody. So the Christian life thus has at its center becoming conscious of that relationship. So in other words, if you want to get to the heart of Christianity, you have to be like Thomas Merton. You have to go into altered states of consciousness through contemplative prayer and see that God is in everything and everybody. And that's what uh, he calls uh, a mature faith, that a kind of Christianity where you just worship Jesus and think he died for your sins, that's an immature faith. But if you, uh, that's like a childish faith. If you want a mature faith or an adult faith, then you have to embrace this new paradigm Christianity that where Jesus is just a model for Christ consciousness and that God is in everything and everybody. And what makes this so important how many have pen and paper available? You should write this down. Get out, get out your pens and your, and your papers because you can look this up on the internet. Remember we were talking about the emerging church uh, in the last talk? Well, in, I think it was June, May or June, I think it was June of 2006, Marcus Borg and Brian McLaren met at the Center for Spirituality in Portland, Oregon, to do a seminar on how to get contemplative prayer into the evangelical church. You know, which I consider, I consider that a very significant, uh, you know, uh, uh, occasion. Because in the workbook for this uh, uh, book here, The Heart of Christianity, there's a workbook that comes with it. Uh, Marcus Borg says that Brian McLaren is one of the evangelicals who is promoting uh, new paradigms uh, Christianity in the evangelical church. So this is, uh, just look up Marcus Borg and Brian McLaren, uh, Center for Spiritual Development, uh, June 2006. June 2006, and you can read about what they did together there. So we have a marriage of, uh, you know, mystical mainline Protestantism with so-called evangelical Protestantism, the liberal left wing of evangelical Protestantism with Marcus Borg and Brian McLaren. But see, Christians traditionally have thought about cults, you know, that there's Christianity, then there's cults. But what we're seeing now is that many, many churches are turning into cults in the traditional sense of the word. See, if Marcus Borg would have been around, you know, uh, 30, 40 years ago, he would be considered a cult leader, right? Well, now he's considered this wise man of God, you know, that a lot of pastors are reading. His name pops up a lot, in, especially in the mainline denominations. This is a book called Setting the Gospel Free. Well, does the gospel need to be set free? Well, if it, well how do you set it free? Well, this is uh, uh, Brian C. Taylor. He teaches contemplative prayer. He's an Episcopal priest. He says, these contemplatives, see, there's that, you know, that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about... Uh, hippies, you know, in communes. We're talking about people that are in organized Christianity. These contemplatives or meditators also recognize their soulmates in other traditions or other religions, as did Thomas Merton in his pilgrimage to Buddhist Asia. This, this is because they have passed beyond the confines of religion as a closed system to an open awareness of God in life. So in other words, when you go, when you do contemplative prayer and go into these these uh, states of higher consciousness, then Christianity is no longer this closed system. Now you can find your soulmates and other in Hinduism and Buddhism, and uh, you see that God is in everything. So therefore, that is setting the gospel free. If the gospel's disconfined to Christianity, then you know it's bad, so you have to set it free by embracing the, the mysticism, all the world's religions. Well, you have no gospel then. You know, setting the gospel free is really tossing the gospel out, right? 
Yeah, so setting the gospel free is getting rid of it. But see, you read that, and there's a certain type of person that, yeah, do I want to be part of this closed system, or do I want open awareness? You know, it, it kind of appeals to your sense of, uh, of idealism. Okay, this is uh, Father Thomas Ryan. Now, he looks like a nice guy, doesn't he? I mean, he looks like the type of guy you'd have over for dinner, right? <laughs> you know, we're not talking about, you know, uh, Marilyn Manson or, you know, things like that. <laughs> we're talking about nice folks. I mean, he looks like somebody who'd be in the audience here, doesn't he? <laughs> you know, nice people. But he wrote a book called Disciplines for Christian Living, Interfaith uh, Perspectives, Interfaith. And he's one of these people that, uh, you know, like I'm talking about, he sees... Uh, the same kind of, uh, of things that Thomas Merton saw. And uh, Henry Nouwen wrote the foreword to this book. And in it, Henry Nouwen said that Ryan, that's the person we saw there, uh, the author shows a wonderful openness to the gifts of Buddhism, Hinduism, and Muslim religion. He discovers their great wisdom for the spiritual life of the Christian. Ryan went to India to learn from spiritual traditions other than his own, he brought home many treasures and offers them to us in the book. So words like wonderful openness, great wisdom, you know. Well, what kind of uh, great wisdom does Hinduism and Muslim and Buddhism have for Christians? You know, I mean, Buddhism, well, we'll get to Buddhism and Hinduism in a moment, but Muslim, the Muslim religion, Islam, says that God has no son. You know, and everything is based on the day of judgment, how good you were, you know, what your works were. So uh, God has no son, you know, there's no atonement, there's no redemption. In fact, uh, Thomas Merton addressed this uh, when he had correspondence with a Sufi mystic, Sufi sheikh, wasn't the same one that uh, we saw earlier. And uh, the Sufi sheikh said that Islam doesn't have any doctrine of atonement or redemption. And Thomas Merton said, well, that's okay, that doesn't matter because, you know, the main thing is Muslims and Christians uh, share in divine light or share in these mystical encounters. So doctrine doesn't mean anything. It kind of takes you away from spiritual realities. And Henry Nouwen was the same way. This is uh, Raymond Bailey's book, Thomas Merton on Mysticism. Uh, the reason I focus on Thomas Merton so much is because he's kind of like the He's like to contemplative prayer what Henry Ford was to the automobile. I mean, there were cars before Henry Ford came along, but he kind of made it, so he was kind of like the, the one that made him really uh, uh, popular and made him available to everybody. See, before Henry Ford, you had to be rich if you had a car. But Henry Ford made uh, you know, the Model T and then everybody could have one. So before Thomas Merton, you know, only people in convents did contemplative prayer, Thomas Merton made it where everybody could do contemplative prayer. So that's why I focus on him so much. So he's like the, the main icon or the main uh, model for contemplative prayer. And virtually everybody in the contemplative prayer movement uh, point to him as being the, the, the great font of wisdom that, uh, or fount of wisdom that uh, uh, they see as uh, a guide. He's seen as kind of like a guide to contemplative awareness. Okay, his, Merton's change of mind with regard to the higher religions was not the result of tedious comparison and contrast or even concerted analysis. In other words, what happened to Thomas Merton was not the result of comparing doctrines like seeing what Islam said and seeing what Christianity said or in analyzing what Buddhists believe and what Christians believe. It had nothing to do with the intellect. It was an outgrowth of his experience with the absolute. Now, did you all get that? Did everybody understand that? Thomas Merton became what he became, not because this made sense to him or that made sense to him, but because of his experience in meditation. You know, he experienced the same things that the Buddhists, Hindus, and Muslims experienced. And that's what turned him into what he became, was his mystical experiences. This is a book called Finding Grace at the Center by Basil Pennington. Uh, now, doesn't that sound like a Christian book, Finding Grace at the Center? Doesn't that sound Christian? And he says, many Christians who take their prayer life seriously have been greatly helped by yoga, Zen, transcendental meditation, and similar practices. 
Okay. He says that I would, I would like to say that we Christians should not hesitate to make use of the good teachings that our wise friends from the East are offering. We should not hesitate to take the fruit of the age-old wisdom of the East and capture it for Christ. Well, how can you capture the wisdom of the East for Christ? You know, on one hand, you know, Christ is the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world. On the other hand, man is God. So how can you capture that for Christ? You can't have both. If man is God, he doesn't need a savior, right? I mean, you can't mix them together. They're, they're, it just won't work. It just isn't uh, something that can be done. You know, our, our wise friends from the East are offering, well, we should be evangelizing them, not, uh, not accepting their spirituality. You know, the Great Commission is go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, not go into all the world and mystically unite with every creature. Okay, this is Father Thomas Keating. This one will get you, this, this one kind of gets me. He says, in order to guide persons having this experience, divine oneness, Christian spiritual, spiritual directors may need to dialogue with Eastern teachers in order to get a fuller understanding. So what he's saying is if you're a Christian spiritual director and you're teaching someone contemplative prayer and they're having Eastern experiences, you need to call up a Zen master or a yogi and say, what's going on, what should I do? In other words, I've taught this guy uh, centering prayer and he's having these experiences. What's going on here? And then the, the, the Hindu will tell you, well, that's okay, this is, this is how it works. And, you know, to get a fuller understanding. Mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. This is uh, Spiritual Directors International. Now, now, to me, this picture is very intriguing. This picture is extremely intriguing because we have this woman and she's kind of going like this, right? And there's this like big ball of light and it's kind of like just right in front of her and it's like she's saying, come on, I'm here, take me, right? Well anyhow, uh, when I read to you what uh, this organization uh, is all about, you know, this picture takes on a very um, disturbing connotation. Uh, throughout human history, individuals have been called to accompany others seeking the mystery we name God. And this time, Spiritual Directors International responds to this call by tending the holy across the world and across traditions. I want you to, before I flip this here, I want you to look at that picture again of that woman and that uh, light that's in front of her. To me, that's uh, when you find out what this organization is all about, that, that's really disturbing. Okay? These are some of their courses and classes. Okay, building a bridge to Buddhism. Ignatian exercise in ecology, cosmology. Okay, the Enneagram and Kabbalah. The sacred labyrinth, a new spiritual paradigm. Earth prayer, celebrating the interconnection of all living beings. Trans faith spirituality. Well, you know, interconnection of all living beings, that's you know, what we saw earlier. That's what Hinduism and occultism is all about. All is one. Building a bridge to Buddhism doesn't mean evangelizing Buddhists, it means building a bridge to them, uniting with them. So when you find out what they, what they teach here, that picture you know, means that this woman is opening herself up to this mystical force or energy. And this mystical force and energy is not the Holy Spirit. So now we're gonna look at how many people uh, are spiritual directors in the US not a whole lot in Africa, Asia, Europe, the Caribbean, or Canada, but there's 1,600 in the U.S. Midwest, okay? There's 5,000 in the United States. You can see the different uh, areas there. The Midwest has more than, people always talk about how California is this flaky, hippie place where weirdos are, but, but most of the spiritual directors are in the U.S. Midwest, 1,638, and uh, I think uh, the Southwest would be 853. I suppose that would be California. But uh, 5,000 spiritual directors are offering contemplative prayer in the US, and if each one trains 100 a year, that's a half a million a year. And over the course of a few years, you know, you're looking at you know, quite a number of people, you know, millions of people being trained to um, except uh, a God that uh, wants all the world's religions to go together, you know, building a bridge to Buddhism. Okay, even in uh, evangelical Christianity, today's Christian woman had a, 
thing on how a spiritual director can help you grow in your faith. And in this article, the, um, the type of spiritual direction was in line with uh, what we're looking at here. It was, I think Brennan Manning was, was uh, used in some of the uh, other uh, place, Shalem Institute for uh, Spiritual Direction was mentioned, so that it was talking about this type of spiritual director. This is uh, the Shalom Prayer Center in Mount Angel, Oregon. This is where they train spiritual directors from a, not, just, not just from one denomination, but from a variety of denominations. People from all di- the whole gamut come here to be trained as spiritual directors. And in October of 2002, they invited a Reiki master to come there and initiate people in, uh, in, into Reiki, which shows what kind of a, a training these spiritual directors get. Okay, Intermysticism. This is a book called The Mystic Hearts. Uh, it says the third millennial spirituality will also be interspiritual and intermystical. In other words, this religion that's coming on the forefront is going to be interconnected. It's not going to be you know, people that are fundamentalists, whether they're Muslim fundamentalists or Christian fundamentalists, have no place in this coming religion in the third millennium because everybody has to be open to this idea of all is one and that God can be in everything and everybody and there's no such thing as just my religion is true. Inner mysticism is the realization that there is one universal tradition of the mystical life with many branches. So no one can say that, you know, my religion's right and yours is wrong because there's one universal tradition which all the world's religions come out of and all the religions are now returning to that one source. It's like everybody's going home to their mother. Everybody's going home to their main source. But of course, Christianity uh, did not come out of, true Christianity and Judaism did not come out of one universal source. Okay, worshiping idols. Here we have uh, in India, uh, you have uh, you know, millions of idols in India, and there we have a woman who's uh, offering uh, sacrifice to the elephant god Ganesha. Uh, this is where a, lo- you know, a lot of New Age spirituality comes from, is India. This is the source, and... Uh, Buddhism is another source, and this is actually from a Buddhist magazine. This is not a Christian article. This was written by a Buddhist practitioner. It was in Shambhala Sun, which is a Buddhist magazine. He was explaining Buddhism, and in explaining Buddhism, you see the contrast with Christianity you know, very vividly. Uh, he, he, his name is Reginald Ray. He wrote, the Buddhist approach states that what is ultimately required for human fulfillment is a perfection of being that is found in who we already are. Buddha's advice, seek refuge in themselves and to seek no other refuge. Rely only on ourselves using various methods to explore our own human nature as it exists. So in other words, this is the polar opposite of Christianity because Buddhism denies that there is any god or deity that um, you have to have faith in because that would mean that this God would be outside of yourself. This is a religion without God. What they believe in is the Buddha nature, which is very similar to Hinduism's higher self. So what you're supposed to seek refuge in is the Buddha nature or the perfection of whom you already are. And there we see a picture of the Dalai Lama whom Thomas Merton was very close with and they considered themselves soulmates. Okay, why is interfaith and ecumenism wrong? Well, because, quite frankly, the Bible says so. It says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord has Christ with Belial, or what part hath he that, is, that believeth with an infidel, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? I mean, that's a big one right there. Buddhism and Hinduism are saturated with idols. Okay, for a year, the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, because of that, come out from among them and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So in Christianity, you're supposed to be loving toward people of other religions. Uh, Peter says, uh, uh, honor all men. You're not supposed to 
crusade against them in the sense you want to burn down their temples and hurt them and call them names. You're supposed to be uh, very loving, but you're supposed to also stand firm as to what the way of salvation is. You're not supposed to you know, join with them in the sense of, of their religion. Come out from among them and be separate and touch not the unclean thing. Well, Thomas Merton and Henry, contrast this, folks, with what Henry Nouwen wrote in that book, you know, wonderful openness, many treasures, remember? Wonderful openness to the gifts of Buddhist, Buddhist, Hindu, and Muslim religion. I mean, that was extremely radical in the sense of what we're seeing here. It's the polar opposite. It's, in other words, it's a fundamental rejection of what's being said in Second Corinthians here. And also it says, but I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God, and I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. In other words, in these mystical movements we've been looking at today, people are having fellowship with devils because, as we're going to see here in a moment, uh, there's a certain uh, doctrine that is always associated with Satan and with devils. Okay, the problem with contemplatives... If they were really so close to God, they would understand and embrace Christianity to a degree that would be shockingly clear. In other words, if contemplative prayer really was Christian, people like Thomas Merton and Henry Nouwen and M. Scott Peck and all these people, uh, Sue Monk Kidd, they'd be like Charles Spurgeon, right? If contemplative prayer really was Christian, but this is not the case. But in reality, contemplative prayer has taken them the opposite direction. Instead of being valiant stewards of the Great Commission, it has caused them to be immersed in spiritual adultery. Spiritual adultery, that's what we're looking at here, spiritual adultery. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. You know, Henry Nouwen said that it's up to him to help people find his or her own way to God. Obviously, the, the preaching of the cross is not the power of God to him, and the catalyst for this was contemplative prayer. This is what I see all over the place. No one ever goes in the, in the direction of the preaching of the cross when contemplative prayer is being practiced. This is what I meant with my uh, statement earlier. You know, for you, Lucifer, have said in your heart, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Any spiritual belief that makes you believe that your God is satanic. You know, I will be like the Most High. You know, creation, contemplative prayer gives you the holiness of everything. You know, everything is God. Everything is God. I will be like the Most High. He he didn't say he will be the Most High. He said he will be like the Most High. So in other words, it's, it's very, it's like, you know, I know of uh, the day will come when a Reiki master or a yoga practitioner or uh, somebody will come up to me and say, you know, how can you say that Reiki's satanic or how can you say yoga is satanic? You know, we don't worship Satan. You know, we, we, we preach love and brotherhood and compassion. How dare you say, I'm highly offended you say that, that Reiki is satanic. Well, that term namaste, you see it in Reiki too. The idea that man is divine is... Like this, Isaiah 14, I will be like the Most High. Anything where the creation takes on the identity of the creator is satanic. Amen? Amen. You know? So there's a logic there. It's not, it's, not, it's not some kind of prejudice. You know, it's, you can see it. I will be like the Most High. That's what I see behind all these spiritual approaches, that man is divine And if man is divine, he doesn't need the cross. If he's already connected to God, he doesn't need to be saved, right? To me, it's very clear. I mean, I don't think I'm misconstruing anything here. I don't think I'm taking anything out of context or or, uh, missing something. Okay, heresy and apostasy. The magnitude of the departure from Orthodox Christianity as well as the inroads that mystical Eastern spiritual practices have made in business, government, health care, and education suggest this is all leading to a huge climax which could be the worldwide deception and grievous time of trouble that the book of Revelation foretells. And I'll leave that to people more skilled and, and studied in that, uh, that realm. But uh, this concludes uh, the three main talks today. And now I'm open to uh, questions.
We are saved by the blood on the cross. We are saved by the life that was lost. By the life that was lost. By the life regained. He was laid in the grave, but he never remained. He arose from the ground. He arose from the cave. He arose from the tomb. He defeated the grave, and we are slain. We are saved by the blood of the Lamb. We are saved by the holes in His hands. By the holes in His hands. Destined to die. He hangs from the cross. Why have you forsaken me to this We stare and we gloat and we point all his bones are full. Out of joy, he is poured out like water. His heart turns wax. We shrug and walk away, ignoring the fact that ours is. I love